joining us. Um, today's webinar is utilizing grassroots advocacy to build your member base. Um, I'm Troy Atkins. I'm Director of Networks and Member Engagement at IS. And I'll give you a little history. Hopefully some of you tuned in to the last webinar or the, the web event before that um, on business and membership models in particular. Um, so if not, I'll give you a little bit of history on where this idea came from. For a while now, IS has actually been considering its own business model. And as part of the thinking that we did around that, we actually had conversations with members and we would go out to their organization, ask about their models, try and find new innovative ideas and approaches um, to engaging constituents and, um, and the like. And what we realized quickly as we found so much value in these conversations and in the learnings that we were, um, we were bringing back from these meetings, um, we thought that our member organizations that might also be considering business model changes might find some value in these as well. So we decided to um, bring in members and do these web events, and um, that's where we are. So I'll give you a couple of uh, housekeeping tips, and then I'll move quickly into the speaker, and I'll hush and get out of the way. Um, so. If you have questions as we go through the presentation, you um, you can use the chat box. There's a, a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, I believe. Um, and then once those questions come through to us, um, Nina and I will go through those questions at the end of the presentation. Um, and then during the, the presentation itself, if you have any general comments, you can type it into the chat box. Um, and we will have a three-question survey for you at the end of the web event, so stay tuned for that. Um, and then without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our speaker. Uh, Nina Cincelli is both Chief Counsel of Government and Public Affairs at American for the Arts. Uh, she's also the Executive Director of uh, Americans for the Arts Action Fund. And since 1993, Nina has served as the Chief Policy Strategist for Americans for the Arts, federal, state, and local government and public affairs work. Grassroots advocacy campaigns, policy development, and national coalition building efforts uh, with both cultural and civic organizations that advance um, arts in the U.S. Uh, in 2009, Nina Spear headed a very successful Arts Equals Jobs advocacy campaign that strategically secured $50 million of federal support for more than 7,000 arts jobs and millions of dollars more for arts infrastructure projects within the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Uh, Nina has produced several programmatic events, including the National Arts Advocacy Day on Capitol Hill with Nancy Hanks Lecture, oh, I'm sorry, the Nancy Hanks Lecture on Arts and Public Policy at the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, and also the National Public Leadership in the Arts Awards, uh, which are presented in partnership with the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Serving simultaneously as the Executive Director of Americans for the Arts Action Fund and its Connected Policy uh, Political Action Committee, uh, the only dedicated arts PAC in America, uh, Nina mobilizes the political and legislative efforts of more than 300,000 citizen activists in advancing arts policy issues among legislatures, legislators and candidates seeking federal public office. She recently completed Arts Vote 2016, culminating with high-profile arts policy events at both the Republican National Convention in Cleveland and the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia. Uh, Nina is a graduate of George Washington University with a BA in French Literature um, and the University of Richmond School of Law with a JD. Um, and she's a member of the Virginia State Bar. So without further ado, I'll turn things over to Nina. Thank you, Troy. And I want to thank the independent sector for hosting today's webinar and giving us a chance to share a fairly unique uh, membership model that we have created really taking advantage of grassroots advocacy as a vehicle to cultivate, nurture, and recruit new members to the organization. In order to understand um, the Arts Action Fund, I think it's important to um, first go back a few steps and talk about Americans for the Arts itself. <clears throat> Americans for the Arts is, a, is the 
large nonprofit charity organization, a 501c3. Um, it is an organization representing 1,300 members who are primarily local, regional, and state arts councils all across the country. They are part of our membership because they are seeking professional development and networking opportunities to be able to learn best practices from others working in similar fields within different cities. Uh, we also produce an enormous amount of uh, research to help advance the arts, and we have a fairly established uh, government affairs team to help advance arts policy issues. And one of the main things that the government affairs team does is it unites the greater arts and culture field for something called National Arts Advocacy Day on Capitol Hill, which happens every year in March, to create a platform and a united position of advancing the arts and culture in a multitude of issues. Um, this past year, they had 12 platform issues that they um, approached Congress with, and it's everything from funding for the National Endowment for the Arts to arts education issues to tax issues, to saving um, um, community development block grants, transportation issues in public art, so about 12 platform issues. Uh, what we found um, in terms of if we have this kind of a large government affairs team already doing government affairs work, why do we need um, to build a different organization um, with a different membership model? And the reason is that we looked around and we knew that we had great stakeholders who were representing their community excellently in terms of advancing federal arts policies before Congress and the White House. But what we also found that we needed was a multitude of voices, just sheer numbers to enhance the political clout of the nonprofit arts community. So we looked around to see what other kinds of organizations might have models like this. And what we found is um, the Sierra Club for the Arts. Uh, and we, we wanted to become like the Sierra Club for the Arts. Um, we looked at Sierra Club, which started off as a foundation and then um, also uh, uh, developed a membership category where they essentially brought in individuals who were not necessarily professionals within the environmental field, but great advocates, lovers of the environment, um, participating highly in environmental um, outdoor activities, and created a program so that they got them more engaged in those kinds of activities, but also over time turned them into advocates for policy issues. And so that was the formula that we also wanted to look for, is a way to take everyday citizens who are lovers of the arts, highly participating in the arts, with a combination of those professionally in the, in the arts, and to create an individual-based membership that would create essentially a grassroots movement over time to be able to advance the arts in a much more stronger way by having both a deep and a broad constituency. The second thing that we wanted was individuals. We knew that we wanted to enhance our advocacy efforts that we were doing on the C3 side under the American for the Arts umbrella, but we also wanted to begin engaging in electoral activities. And as we all know, as a C3, charities are expressly prohibited from engaging in electoral activities. So we needed to also find an umbrella organization where electoral activities could be allowed, as well as the possibility of raising funds for a political action committee to help support pro-arts candidates. And so the model that we ended up with is a 501c4 organization, also known as a social welfare organization which can spend 100% of its time on lobbying unrestricted, if we so choose, and um, up to about 50% of its expenses and time and resources on electoral activities. Additionally, we chose to create what's called a connected political action committee that is simply segregated in a separate 
bank fund, but um, it is a connected political action committee to the C4. So in terms of how that looks as a diagram, um, Americans for the Arts, the C3, and the Americans for the Arts Action Fund, which we short um, cut the name to just Arts Action Fund among us, and those two are connected organizations. We um, call the Arts Action Fund an affiliate of Americans for the Arts. It has a very close relationship in that uh, the Arts Action Fund is housed within Americans for the Arts. It pays rent. Um, it pays for the resources that we use. But it, it is um, housed within Americans for the Arts. It shares membership. We make um, all Americans for the Arts members as part of their C3 membership benefit an automatic member of the Arts Action Fund. People can opt out, but it is um, a service that we provide to the Arts Action Fund um, and to Americans for the Arts. Um, thirdly, um, in terms of we, uh, more shared efforts, the Americans for the Arts is a large supporter financially of the Arts Action Fund. It provides an annual general operating support grant um, that the Arts Action Fund can use on just educational, um, some of our educational efforts. And if we so choose, we can also um, spend some of it on lobbying activity and grassroots activity, but we need to track that because it would then count against the C3's um, lobbying limit that it has to report to the IRS. Um, we do enough educational activities under the Arts Action Fund that we don't have to move into that territory. Um, what we instead do is use contributions that the Arts Action Fund um, generates through its members and some membership dues to pay for our electoral activities so that the grant that we get from the C3 is just used for C3 activities. Um, but it's just not limited. So for those of you who are thinking differently, you don't have to be handcuffed that way. You just have to track it really well. Um, additionally, the Arts Action Fund, as I mentioned earlier, is connected to the Arts Action Fund PAC. The important thing to note here is that um, while the Action Fund is connected to AFTA, the Arts Action Fund PAC absolutely cannot be connected to the C3. There can be, there has to be a very large firewall between Americans for the Arts and the Arts Action Fund PAC. Um, so. We make sure we do that through um, the way we track our time, the way we track our finances and resources, and shared activities, or, or in this case, not sharing activities. Um, so that's an important piece. You'll note that um, even though we shortcut our name to Arts Action Fund and Arts Action Fund, the full name is Americans for the Arts Action Fund PAC. So despite the fact that Americans for the Arts the C3 and the Americans for the Arts Action Fund PAC cannot have a legal connection. Um, they share part of the same name, and that is legally allowed. Um, I thought I could go over just a little bit about what some of the overall mission and goals of the Arts Action Fund are, um, and how and sometimes it overlaps with AFTA's government affairs work, and sometimes it expands and takes a further leap. Um, so the first one is in generating political support for public funding of the arts at the federal, state, and local levels. We do advocacy for all three levels here so that nonprofit arts organizations have access to more than $1 billion in public funding for the arts. So Americans for the Arts, the C3, also has a goal of having a $1 billion of public funding for the arts. Um, the difference is they capitalize on their legislative support, and we add to that by also capitalizing on using political activity to achieve that goal as well. Second thing is we, we have a goal of recruiting one million arts advocates to create the political clout that we need to get pro-arts legislation passed and pro-arts candidates elected into office. And the candidate work that we do is just limited to the federal level, um, whereas the legislative work we do is federal, state, and local. And that has more to do with all of the registration requirements for a PAC at the state level. Um, we don't have the staff capacity to expand in that way yet, 
um, but it might be something down the road in the horizon. Um, currently, um, Troy mentioned we have 350,000. Um, actually, in my bio, it had 300,000 members, and the reason for that is that when I gave you the bio, probably back in January when we um, agreed to do this, we've had a huge leap in membership, and a lot of that has to do with the initiatives that are being put forward by the Trump administration in trying to kill the NEA. A lot more people are interested in getting engaged in arts advocacy. So that gives you an indication of the amount of growth that can happen, 50,000 members in about five months. Yeah. Not a, a problem <laughs> per se. Um, um, another overall goal is to create a bipartisan pro-arts majority in Congress. This is not an organization that is either Republican or Democratic. All we care about is that we have a bipartisan pro-arts majority in Congress, and it doesn't matter what stripe or color or party affiliation it, we need to have to get there as long as um, it's a majority of members who are pro-arts. Um, and then finally, um, we want to develop a national arts, developing and maintaining, we've already developed an arts vote campaign with active uh, ground game in early primary states. This is primarily during the presidential election years. Um, we get very involved in early primary states in coordinating activity to engage candidates. Um, we do this uh, a little bit as well during congressional elections in the alternate years, um, but we really get geared up every four years in doing this kind of work on the ground level. In terms of um, the legislative issues, I mentioned how we overlap a lot of times with Americans for the Arts and sometimes um, expand a little bit further. Um, the last part of that bullet point underscores this and that Legislatively, Americans for the Arts and the folks that get to come around for Arts Advocacy Day are looking at the next fiscal year ahead of them in terms of what their legislative goals are. So I'll give you an example. Um, the funding for the National Endowment for the Arts is currently at $150 million, and the request among all these arts organizations is to increase it by $5 million to $155 million. Um, we at, at the Arts Action Fund also adopt that same policy and we want to be completely in sync with Americans for the Arts and our colleagues. Um, the only thing that we do is take it a step further and look at the horizon and long-term future of where we want to take the arts. And, and, our, um, and the reason why that's important is that when we, we're not just talking to legislators, we're talking to candidates who will be future legislators. And when you're talking to candidates, you can have a broader, more long-term vision that you can help get them on board with earlier. And our long-term vision is to have a dollar per capita of spending for the arts, which would be closer to $350 million instead of $155 million. Um, so that would be an example of how our advocacy work complements the work of our sister organization, Americans for the Arts, um, but also for looking down the future more. Um, some of the ways that um, we accomplish what some of those vision ideas are is that we, we try to recruit as many members as possible. As I mentioned, we're at 350,000 now, and we get them to pledge to help us to do the following things. To stand up for every child's right to a comprehensive, high-quality arts education to promote public policies that provide individuals and families affordable access to all forms of the arts, to rally national support against attacks for the arts, which we've been meeting a lot lately, and to build political influence to ensure bipartisan support for the arts. And I think it's important to bring these up because we do this in the form of a pledge. Um, and for all of our members who sign up to become Arts Action Fund members, we ask them if they could sign up to this pledge because that's what their membership is going to be about. This is not a membership that is about the list of benefits that they get, discounts to things or premiums for things. This is a membership that is very much about a policy goal um, and it's about an advocacy movement. So the way we market our membership is very different than a different kind of membership that's about associating value with the price of a membership. Um, 
when Americans for the Arts was first created in 2004, um, I mentioned we wanted to create a grassroots movement of one million people. But in order to create a grassroots movement, um, you can do it a few different ways. You do not necessarily need a membership structure to have a grassroots movement. You can just have a lot of people involved in your work and you can involve them in your action alerts. The reason why the Arts Action Fund as a 501c4 needed to create a formal membership base is because we created that Connected Political Action Committee. When you have a Connected Political Action Committee, one of the requirements of that is that when you go to raise money for candidates and for your own PAC, you can only solicit those who are quote unquote bona fide members of your organization. And the reason why that's important is that if you can accomplish that, then the money that you spend on raising money for a PAC, and you know fundraising can be an expensive um, expenditure, whether it's traveling to meet with donors, whether it's printing materials for a direct mail piece, or whether it's having special events and hosting them. All those things cost money, including the stamps and the office time and um, labor time to raise that money. When you have a connected PAC, you do not have to use PAC funds to pay for those expenses. Um, when it's a connected PAC, you can use your membership money that you generated or your contributions money that you generated for the Arts Action Fund to pay for those expenses. The one thing we can't use to pay for those expenses is that general operating support grant from Americans for the Arts, because that has to be for only educational purposes. So where we saw it at first, back in 2004 when we first started, that this was a requirement that we were forced to do, is to create this membership. Over time, we have seen that actually this was the best thing that could have been created because it is that membership structure that is helping us to move the ball down the field in terms of arts policy advancement, and it is that membership structure that's giving us the support and resources that we need to be able to raise funds for um, political activity and for raising funds for Pro Arts Canada. So, um, I, I just went over that slide, so I'm going to skip over this one to talk a little bit um, about the PAC, and then I will go back to the membership um, in more detail, because I know that's a main part of this webinar. Um, so I mentioned um, as, uh, that the PAC is a quote-unquote connected PAC, and that is something that is an FEC term. Something that's important to know is that whereas a 501c3 charity is regulated by the IRS, um, a 501c4 um, is regulated by both the IRS and sometimes the FEC, FEC, especially if it engages in electoral activity and especially if it has a connected political action committee. Um, so we have to be mindful of both of these regulatory agencies in terms of how we conduct our business. And earlier I said I would come back to this notion of what is bona fide. Um, this is also a legal term and not just a term that I'm using as an adjective to describe our membership. Um, bona fide membership is a term that's um, defined by the FEC in terms of how a connected um, 501c4 can have membership to be able to solicit these people to raise money for um, your PAC. And some of the things that in, are involved in that are if you have a paid membership, which is what we originally started with, if you have a paid um, membership, the fact that someone is giving you money for, um, for belonging to your organization um, meets the minimum requirements for a bona fide membership. Where it became an issue for us is um, about uh, oh, I'd say um, eight years after we started, we decided um, that the expense of spending money on 
um, getting paid memberships was um, uh, something that was just keeping us staying in the same position over and over again because you're spending almost as much money to raise the money for the membership. And really what our goal was more members so that we could have that political clout to get to one million members. So um, along the way, we chose to go from a dues-based membership to a uh, free membership model. Um, and I will jump to that. Oops. Uh, we chose to go to a free membership model. Um, and the reason for that is that um, it helped us to have really a much more quantum leap um, rate of growth to achieve that first goal that we had set out of having one million members. Um, the, I will get to how we actually raise money, though, to be able to pay for expenses in a moment, but what I wanted to say is when you have a free membership, that triggers um, a different thing in terms of bona fide membership. Um, before, you, we met the test because uh, members were those who paid us a membership fee. But when you go to a free membership model, you have to use other means of um, determining how someone can be, um, be classified as a bona fide member. And one of those things is we created a policy vote on an annual basis where the members would <clears throat> vote on what our policy positions would be on an annual basis and our board would be required to observe and um, agree to whatever the decision is of the membership in terms of how they voted on the positions that we were taking on. We would choose three legislative issues. One is funding for the National Endowment for the Arts, an arts education policy, and the preservation of the charitable tax incentive. And based on those three policy issues, we focused our resources and our time and our lobbying and our grassroots advocacy work and our cultivation of candidates around those three primary issues. And um, by having that option for the membership to have such an incredible um, role in playing on how the organization spends its time and money meets one of the requirements of bona fide membership. Additional things that meet the bona fide membership, because not everybody votes um, or wants to vote, there are other ways of doing it too. Um, another is when we do action alerts and, set, and we send out emails saying, please send a, a letter to Congress. If they take that action and send the letter to Congress, that shows a meaningful involvement in the organization. That also meets the bona fide test. Another example would be um, if we have an event and we're doing a briefing on the latest from Washington, let's say I fly out to California and I do a series of briefings, which I do on a regular basis. Um, anyone who attends that event, um, if, the, if they were existing members it, um, and they sign up for it, we keep all of that data and put it into our database. That also signifies that they are a bona fide member because it's showing some kind of meaningful involvement in staying connected to the organization. So a combination of having the option of the policy vote and these opportunities for meaningful involvement all meet the opportunities, um, the tests for bona fide. And of course, there's nothing better than if they give you a contribution. Any kind of exchange of money where they're, at, they're giving, making a donation or paying for something are all examples of bona fide involvement in membership. And the reason why that is the holy grail is because the only people that the Arts Action Fund can solicit to give a PAC contribution to our PAC are bona fide members. And if they're not bona fide, we can't solicit them and we have to treat them differently. Um, in terms of um, membership, you will see that, as I mentioned, we do now have this free membership base, but there are people who still like to give us money because they believe in our cause. Sometimes they want to give us money based on campaigns we're running. Some of them just want to, on an annual basis, that's the way they run their financials, they want to give us um, a member, um, an annual membership. So we have several levels that people can do it, but the main thing is that there is that free advocate level, which allows us to go 
broadly across the country and ask people to um, come into the fold and become a member of the Arts Action Fund. Um, the only thing that we do that differentiates them with these different values is that at minimum, if you give $20 um, or more, um, you'll get a printed version of our newsletter. Otherwise, we do almost everything um, electronically. And so they would just get an e-version of the newsletter. And if you give $50 or more, um, and those are people who usually give to the PAC um, about $50 uh, or more, and it, they can be, it can be a contribution to the PAC or to the Action Fund. Both of them will trigger a bona fide um, membership category. Um, if they give $50, not only do they get that printed newsletter, but probably the publication that they look forward to the most that we print that is of value to them is our Congressional Arts Report Card. Some people call them a scorecard. And we do this every two years um, right before the elections, and we do an arts score for every um, incumbent who's running for re-election. And we also do candidate surveys for open seats and challengers. Um, and um, giving them those kind of ratings and score right before the election, which is something a C3 cannot do. Um, it's one of the best things that our C4 does do, and it does it very well. And, and a lot of people want to get that print version instead of just an electronic version. So what does our membership growth look like? Mentioned we started in 2004, obviously, with zero members. I think I might have been member, member number one. <laughs> um, and uh, we've had a growth that kind of looks like this today. And what are some of the things that kind of triggered these big moments? Um, well, I'd say that first big growth that you see there in the middle is the year where we went from um, you had to be a paid member to opening it up to free membership. That yielded the first growth spurt. And then <clears throat> the second growth spurt is we created partnership programs with other national organizations and corporations, actually. And what it was is an opportunity where if very similar to what we did with Americans for the Arts, we um, Americans for the Arts added a membership benefit to their membership of 1,300 organizational members. And they said, One of the, we have a new benefit for you. You're going to become a free member of the Arts Action Fund now. And what we did is we went to a lot of other national membership-based arts organizations and suggested that they do, the sim they do similarly so that they automatically made all of their members Action Fund members. And one of the advantages that a lot of groups jumped on this for is that there are communications about political activity that a C3 cannot make to its members. An example would be the Congressional Arts Report Card, a scorecard. Um, whereas if their members are members of our organization as well, we can make that direct communication and let them know about those kind of political inside information that we know about candidates so that it doesn't get the other national organization in trouble because the direct communication is going from us to what are now our new members as well. So we had a lot of success with that. and. Um, this is just a sampling of some of our um, partners that we've had. Um, the most recent one is the one where Amalia, who is our Arts Action Fund program manager, um, was at the Freeze Art Fair in New York City. Uh, Freeze is a major art fair of some of the most cutting edge contemporary art in the world. And galleries from across the world come to it. And they sponsored us to be a partner with them this year. That happened earlier this month, actually, where everybody who bought a ticket to go to the show also had an option to add a contribution to the Arts Action Fund and also had an option to sign on to one of our petitions to Congress um, to ask them to save the NEA. So both of those activities triggered membership, and one of them also triggered contributions to the Arts Action Fund. Another interesting example is Blick. Blick is a very um, big national arts material store where you can go and buy things for visual arts kind of things, and lots of artists go there, and lots of college kids go there. And what they did was they turned a lot of their customers into members of the Arts Action Fund by promoting um, 
um, getting involved in the Arts Action Fund, one of the things that they did is they offered coupons for discounts in their next purchases. Anyone who took advantage of that um, also had to agree to become a new member of the Arts Action Fund. Um, there are lots of other partners as well, but this is an, an example. Um, through our partnership efforts alone, it's yielded over 100,000 new members. Um, I mentioned earlier um, the work we do with the policy vote and the three issues. Um, that's what that looks like. And then here are some of the other ways that we recruit members. Um, and it's also our grassroots activity that we do to help advance the arts in Congress and within the White House and across the country. As I mentioned, when we first created the C4, we had two goals. One is to advance pro arts policy. The second um, was to create a base, a large one million person base, to create the political clout and the ability to raise money for candidates. So here is an example where we're doing two things at the same time. Um, we create online petitions um, that we gather, and this, this latest one is when um, President Trump first came out with the Skitty budget um, and was recommending um, total elimination of the cultural agencies. Um, we put out a petition pretty quickly, generated over 67,000 signatures, and uh, at the same time, it generated a lot of new membership because what happens is people want to send it to their friends and say, you should also sign on to this. And because membership is free, um, it's very easy um, to become a member. And of course, they are fully aware of what they're doing based on the statements that we do on the bottom. This is another example. Uh, a lot of people use different programs. We use Voter Voice for our electronic communication to Congress. So um, we will also send out alerts sometimes where we don't want them to sign the petition, but we actually want them to send the letters directly to their members of Congress. And this most recent one, again, related to Trump um, in asking Congress to not accept his budget proposal, um, generated 168,000 messages to Congress over three. We, this service also creates op-eds and tweets and things like that. It also generated over 3,000 op-eds. So we're getting these grassroots folks to do action um, and the larger we become the more action they can take but at the same time it gives us an opportunity to continue to increase our membership base because at on the left side um, is what they'll see after they sign the petition and i know it's in small print there but it essentially says by signing the petition you also agree to become a member of the arts action fund or to renew your membership um, and then the on the one on the right side is the one that is the emails to Congress. And um, by sending the email, they have an, in both cases, they have an option to opt out of becoming an Arts Action Fund member, but almost everybody wants, if they're taking a action like this on advocacy, they want to stay involved with an organization um, like ours to be able to continue to, to one, find out what happens, two, when to take action again, and when to recruit more members to help us. Um, in terms of some of the electoral activity that we've done that also has helped generate membership, um, every uh, two years we do something called Arts Vote. So the most recent one was Arts Vote 2016. Uh, two years earlier it was called Arts Vote 2014. These are specifically our um, activities that um, in many ways seem like electoral activities, but a lot of times are actually just educational activities as well. Here's an example of that. Um, these are two events that we held at the Republican Convention in 2016 in Cleveland and the Democratic Convention in Philadelphia. For the one in Cleveland, we held a panel um, at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, it was extremely well received, we packed the room, um, we had very high level um, participants, um, a former presidential candidate, Mike Huckabee, was the moderator, we had a governor, mayors, CEOs on the panel, and we mirror the same thing at the DNC, there it was at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, again packed audience, and what we're trying to do is educate delegates on issues related to arts policy and 
um, we're also um, leading up to those events had been um, working on um, influencing the platforms of each one of the parties as they get up to the convention time. Um, this usually yields a lot of new members as well because while we're there, not only do, does everyone who comes to the event, all these delegates, um, become members of the Arts Action Fund, but we do a lot of events within the community as well while we're there. So um, one of the things that we like to do, and I'll have a slide about this in a little bit, is um, we create these bumper stickers that um, say, um, Arts Advocate and I Vote. And so um, it, it delivers exactly the most of the, the mission of the Arts Action Fund. It's, it's combining arts advocacy and electoral activity on an individual basis. Arts Advocate and I Vote. Um, and what we did is we printed thousands and thousands and thousands of these bumper stickers and we had arts groups around the city in both Cleveland and Philadelphia um, distribute those widely on front windows because they're those kind of removable decals, put them on cars so that the arts had a presence when the nation's delegates for both political parties were all in one um, city at one week in time. So we do a lot of those kind of things, and that also helps engage more people to become a member of the Arts Action Fund. Um, some of the activity that we do on the state and local level is um, we focus on ballot initiatives that help um, raise money for the arts or create some kind of arts positive arts policy position. So we take all of these 350,000 or plus members that we've created over the last few years and when a community needs our help, um, whether it's Pinellas County or Denver or Tucson or Rhode Island, um, they say, look, we have a ballot initiative and we need voters. Um, our, typically when organizational say we have organizational members and they're not, and it's just an organization, it's not individual voters. Um, what's, the beauty of our membership is we have individual voters. And so they'll say, we need people to understand what is on that ballot box, what they're voting for, and what's at stake, and why we need them to get out and actually vote yes or vote no on a particular issue. Um, we've had a lot of success in getting out the vote on these ballot initiatives. These four are ones that um, have all passed very successfully, um, and we continue to do that. It's become very much of a trend within the arts of these ballot initiatives happening more and more on ballot boxes on election day. Um, this is some example of our social media. This is our current campaign, the hashtag Save the NEA. Um, we use a lot on Twitter um, and on um, Facebook. And these are actual ads that we had created for Facebook. Um, to get people to not only send uh, a message to Congress, but by sending the message, becoming a new member of the Arts Action Fund. What we did that was very smart about, I think, about these Facebook ads is that we knew that um, gearing up, we needed to see where our holes were. There were new committee structures on the key committees that fund the arts. Um, brand new freshmen or um, incumbents who were in a previous committee now coming on the key subcommittees. And so we took um, an analysis of where we were weak in terms of constituents and members in certain areas of the country that aligned with the congressional districts of key members. And we did Facebook ads early on in January to pump up our membership in that area so that when we needed them to weigh in, on legislative issues to key congressional members, um, we had a larger pool to pull from. And that's an example of these two ads. These are actual newspaper ads. Um, and um, these are ones that are going in key congressional districts as well during the May recess period. The one on the left is strictly a membership um, recruitment thing that we do with arts organizations. A lot of there are a lot of art-related newspapers and arts organizations that put out newsletters that want to help. And they say, let us help promote getting you more members. And so that ad on the left is the one for just creating membership. And um, the one on the right is an ad that we um, placed 
um, in a few districts. Um, there is another ad that is not part of this PowerPoint that we're doing during this May recess that is specifically for um, the GOP members of uh, the subcommittee appropriations that oversee funding for the NEA that are all about the money that's going into their congressional districts, a listing of all the grants that have been made in that air, that geographic area and how um, funding for the federal funding for the arts is not only of value but it's supporting um, important cultural institutions within those communities. Um, we also publish a quarterly newsletter. Um, I mentioned that it's done electronically um, on a quarterly basis but we also print and mail out on snail mail to our higher paying um, donors. And that also helps continue to keep them educated and also brings in uh, a lot more members because people pass that on to their friends. Um, this is that bumper sticker that I mentioned um, that we had distributed widely throughout Philadelphia and Cleveland um, during the summer of 2016 to get more delegates to see um, the issue. And the, I wanted them to have a palpable feeling of presence of the arts during the local um, conventions. Um, but a lot of times our members are also field organizers for us and they will host major events to get briefings. Um, sometimes um, we'll go there in person, sometimes we do it by phone, sometimes we do it on Skype, um, lots of different ways where they just want to stay engaged and they, they serve as field organizers for us to be able to increase membership. Um, that's another thing that we just do when we're looking to fill in gaps of where we might be weak in certain areas um, in terms of a strategic connection with Congress. Um, these are all the ways that you can find us online. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. This is also part of, part of an original ad that we did um, taking the original American Gothic painting and kind of putting iPhone um, pins on them. That was excellent. And I have to say, I'm happy to note that uh, we were just joined by a colleague on our policy team here at IS, um, and that's really perfect timing. Um, I was thrilled to see you come in because I was gonna ask questions um, around, you know, we're focused right now on the Johnson Amendment and um, and there's the separation of the uh, ability to um, do specific types of political activity from the C3 to the C4 to the PAC. And I was gonna butcher a lot of the details, I'm certain of that from my my somewhat decent, but the, the lagging understanding of the Johnson Amendment and all of the other rules and regulations around the, the types of work that these three organization types can do. Um, I'm curious though about, um, and you touched on it a bit, how the, the organization, the work of the organizations and the missions and focuses and goals align, um, and do they differ at that point? Um, there will never be an occasion where the Action Fund would have a different position for the immediate fiscal year or, um, or a policy decision that's not involving appropriations um, for the immediate future. It, it, we will always be in line because we see ourselves as the megaphone for Americans for the Arts and their legislative agenda. Um, we, we were created for that purpose and we serve that purpose. Um, um, where the only times we differ is, um, one is a narrower legislative agenda. On our advocacy day, there are 12 legislative issues, and the average layperson is really not so engaged in some of those details. Um, so we stay on just the top three issues, um, and that's uh, funding for the arts, and arts education issues and funding, and preserving the charitable tax deduction. Um, th that's as far as we go in terms of the range of issues, but those three are exactly in line with our sister agency. And the only time it differs is our longer um, vision for where we wanna take things. Because um, not only is it important to have that longer vision since we're dealing with candidates, we're talking about being a future elected official, 
but it's also more inspiring for, from, a per, from a point of view of raising funds for your organization. Because we don't charge uh, for membership um, as a requirement, um, we rely on our, advocacy, our grassroots advocacy campaigns to help generate funds. So when we send out an action alert, we will also have a button on the bottom to support this particular advocacy campaign with a contribution. And a lot of times having that bigger vision, I mean, it's hard to get a lot of people excited about asking for only $5 million. But, <laughs> but that is the reality of what we can expect legislatively um, in this particular environment. The Arts Action Fund is trying to change that political environment so you have more pro-arts um, elected officials who want to see a more quantum leap. So it's important to talk about the reality of what we can get but inspire people of where we're going. Now, speaking of where you're going, you mentioned a goal of a million members, yes. um, and you're uh, over a third of the way there, and you had some significant bumps in the, the graph that you showed of growth. What, is there a time horizon that you wanna hit the million members, or is that organically coming about and moving at its own pace? Well, um, for instance, we, we had budgeted a goal of increasing by 50000 a year. So we achieved that, per, that first goal of 50000 for this year in the first few months. So um, now Bob Lynch is going to want me to go a higher goal. <laughs> but, uh, but that has been the goal, to go up about 50000 I think everyone would agree that in crisis situations, um, your ability to both raise money and get more people involved in your cause is much easier. Mm. And I'm going to ask a colleague, Lindsay, that we have some, uh, we're in a fairly long room and my contacts aren't quite that strong, but we do have some questions on screen um, that, Lindsay, would you mind reading running that? down the list of those for us and reading those out? Oh, yeah, people should be able to hear you. My apologies. Um, so the first question is um, whether membership dues are tax deduct deductible. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not tax deductible for uh, charitable deduction purposes because um, um, the Arts Action Fund is a 501c4. It's not a charity. It's a nonprofit, but it's not a charity. So it does not um, give the charitable deduction to its donors. However, um, there are plenty of people who are in the arts as a business, and so it is deductible for business expense purposes. So a clarification there too, um, because I, coming from a, a C3 membership organization, um, I was going through the conversation thinking, wow, they moved to free membership. But that's free membership for the arts fund, mm -hmm. uh, not for the C3. If that's you join right. American for the Arts, there is still a membership dues yes. level. Um, and so just wanted to make sure I had that correct in my mind and if anybody right. else might have had the same idea. Um, the next question asks whether the Arts Action Fund has faced any branding challenges um, being connected to Americans for the Arts, but still um, a distinct entity in some ways. Yeah, um, there, there have been positive um, branding um, things because Americans for the Arts is a much larger organization that's been around for over 55 years. And so when you first start an organization and it's riffing off of the name of Americans for the Arts, you get some initial immediate brand recognition. Um, in terms of confusion, um, there has been confusion where someone who, someone who's both an individual member of Americans for the Arts and maybe the head of an organization, and its organization is the head of the Arts Action Fund, will sometimes get confused about um, membership dues. But when we went to that free level, it became less of an issue. When Americans for the Arts made all of its members action fund members, it became less of an issue. Um, I would say the only confusion um, that we currently have is the word fund, F-U-D. Um, and that is because uh, um, 
I mean, if I had had my, if I had been able to look into a crystal ball, um, I would have called it the Arts Action Network instead of the Arts Action Fund, because a lot of times um, people associate the fund as being a place where you have to come and give money to because we're raising money for something. And especially when we went to a free membership and wanted more people than money, it became a little bit confusing. Thank you. Um, next, um, what member recruitment efforts um, for the Arts Action Fund have been most successful? Um, and before the events of this year that catalyzed membership, um, what was most successful before that kind of bump? Mm -hmm. Um, I would say our partnership campaigns with other organizations um, have been extremely successful because um, what it what it can do is you if you partner with the right organization sometimes you can get 40,000 new members in one day um, and that created a big bump and that's just a lot about developing a good relationship with these national um, with some of these national organizations um, that primarily have a membership base of individuals um, because that's the most helpful rather than a membership organization of other organizations. It can work. Um, it still can work. It's just that it's easier when it's a membership base of other individuals. And quite frankly, I think the work that we're doing with uh, for-profit companies that have customers as opposed to members and getting exposing their customers and incentivizing their customers um, to become members of the Arts Action Fund has also been really one of the best things we've done. I was fascinated when you had the Blake logo on one of the slides and you talked about that partnership. That That's a really, really interesting idea. I've taken quite a number of notes um, <laughs> for us to think about as we look at grassroots networks and ways to, to build and grow one. Yeah. Um, so that was fascinating. When people sign up for a membership um, to the fund, do they generally do that as a private individual or as a professional role? Um, our membership base, um, I'd say the majority are individuals who are not professionals in the arts. Um, but we certainly do have a mix. But I would say the majority are definitely um, something that our goal was. Um, we always knew we could catalyze professionals in the arts to be advocates for the arts. The, the hard part is catalyzing people who do not have a self-interest in that advocacy effort to also take time to be an advocate for the arts. I think we've got one more question on screen and then I think we'll wrap up. We've got a couple minutes left here. Um, have you found any unexpected methods for in um, engaging meaningful involvement among members who are less engaged? Yeah, let me think about that for a moment. Sure. And I'm on you. So, you can talk about arts of having our members go out of the field. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, Amaya um, um, brought up a really good one. Um, so a lot of times people don't want to get involved because um, they don't think that their voice matters. Um, and so, especially when we are doing our work with early primary states during a presidential election year, we are trying to find people who are living in a lot of these kind of remote portion uh, parts of a state um, that candidates are going to, but we don't necessarily have advocates who are in that area. And what this is where our field organizers come into play because we will contact them and say, we need to find some kind of authentic voice who can go to a coffee clutch in the upper northwest corner of New Hampshire um, on Tuesday. And so uh, it, they, that what will happen is a big call to folks in that area will ha happen to the field organizers and we'll be able to find a few handful of people and engage them in such a way that they realize that the actions that they take are helping the efforts of an entire country of our advocates. Um, 
where asking that one question that means so much um, in getting a position point of view from a candidate that we hadn't heard from yet on the ARC and getting it as an official answer has proven to be something that um, really has not only helped us engage more people because what we do is then we tell the story of how we tracked down Jane Doe in the no northwest corner of New Hampshire and how she asked this question. She videotaped it. Here's the answer that she got from the particular candidate. She becomes a superstar in our field for, um, for that year and that then triggers others to want to do it when we go to the southwest corner of Iowa and that candidate is there two weeks later and they're getting a follow-up question saying, I know when you answered that question in X place in New Hampshire, you said this, I'd like to follow up and ask you this. They are, the candidates are stunned that there's communication between the two states and that it's coming from these kind of like everyday folks um, in the area. And the important part is that we tell the story of what these individuals are doing to help a larger policy issue. Good answers, good questions, and a great presentation. So thank you, thank you Nina. Um, I, I really appreciate this. Um, this is a, a complicated web of organizations and work, and you spelled it out so that even I can congrats. <laughs> so that's, that's a good thing. Um, hopefully, everybody else who attended online was able to glean something. There's always a nugget of information that hopefully you'll be able to take back with you into your daily work. And if you have questions, you're welcome to reach out to me or the team here. We're happy to answer anything ongoing. Um, this will be or has been recorded at this point and will be posted on our website for future viewing and reviewing um, in case you didn't take notes quickly enough. I scribbled some things and hopefully you guys did as well. So thank you all for attending. Nina, thank you for joining us and um, stay tuned. We will be in touch with hopefully more of these in the future. Thank you all.